Hello and welcome to Pop Up Submissions Live. Today's theme is writing thrillers. And I'm delighted to be joined for the first time ever today by one of Britain's most successful non-fiction writers. Author of such number one bestsellers as Tornado Down, Death Warrant and The Shooting Gallery and many more. Please meet the near legendary Will Pearson. <laughs> and on the, you will be fully legendary by the end of the show. And on the other side of the virtual room, it's the entirely legendary Latopian Jeff Sullivan. Hello again. Yeah, and our last show uh, of the month today, which means very tense time. We're going to get a monthly winner within the next 60 minutes. So let's see how the leaderboard is currently looking. Ella Mishney's middle grade fantasy, The Reality Coder, about an 11 year old girl who can hack the laws of physics, still has a towering lead with 74 points. And last week's winner by Diane Ferrugia is in the lo- number two position. So it literally all depends on this week's show. Better strap in because it's going to get bumpy. And straight on with our very first submission of the day. It's called The Other Infidel. It's a political thriller. Remember, that's our theme, thrillers today. And it's by AJT James, and this is AJT's blurb. After he found out the referendum was being manipulated, things became difficult for Gethin Collins, MP. Keep quiet and reap the rewards? or blow the whistle and see his career, and perhaps his life, ended. Collins begins to investigate and enters a world of fake news, behavioural conditioning and psyops, which may have links with a revolution that's just taken place on the other side of the world. Let me tell you about AJT. I was born and raised in South Wales, he says. I've worked variously as a council housing officer, building site labourer, and for three hours, a door-to-door salesman. I can see that was for like three hours. I was in the I was the first in my family to go to university. Congratulations! Attending when I was in my thirties. After graduating, I became a forensic scientist. That's interesting. Shades of Kay Scarpetta, right? Eh? Uh, my fiction has, has appeared in the New Welsh Review and online in Eclectica, Bookanista, Bandit Fiction, and Café Irreal. Uh, well, now, to which plaudits, of course, you will soon be able to add, imminently be able to add, a uh, fabulous reading by our very own John. The Other Infidel, written by A.J.T. James, read by John. Chapter One. After the crash, there was a lot of speculation about what the man might have been thinking. The truth was that he had been frightened. He had been standing in the departure lounge of Cairo International Airport trying not to show it and decided the best way was silence. His men returned and told him his luggage was loaded and the plane would be taking off in half an hour. He didn't respond. He thought about this mission and he thought about his brother and the things that were alleged to have value and then he signalled for a drink. One of his men poured Siddiqui into four glasses. They drank and filled four more glasses and drank again, and when they'd finished, the mission didn't seem so bad. He sat on his own. His men sat a short distance away. He started the floor for the longest time, even after the announcement that JOI Air Flight JP554 was boarding. One of his men accompanied him onto the plane. The other two left. The man was welcomed at the gate and directed to his pod in the first class cabin. He settled into his seat and fiddled with the clasp of the lap belt. The captain made announcements in Arabic and English, commenting on the August weather and the flight time to Karachi. The plane pushed back and began to taxi away from the terminal and the man wanted to ask the flight attendant if the takeoff would be rough, if the plane would encounter turbulence, but thought he would sound ridiculous so he muttered to himself the phrase about the greatness of God. And then he said to himself, God created you, and then he causes you to die. And he repeated the verse as the roar built up and the aeroplane shook and rattled, and just before leaving the ground, he stopped reciting the verse and clutched the armrests 
and behind the fear, the only phrasing remaining was, he causes you to die. And because he could think of nothing else in his terror, the phrase ricocheted. The plane took off and the man didn't die. It climbed and turned, and when they reached a cruising altitude of 35,000 feet, the flight attendants began moving again, and he looked around. His man was in economy. There was no one he could talk to. Across the pods of first class, there were a few people he recognised. He knew the English politician was somewhere close by, but he couldn't see or hear him. He wiped the sweat from his forehead and shifted in his seat. The plane had been flying for 25 minutes when his luggage exploded. It ripped a 30-inch hole in the skin of the fuselage and aluminium panels petaled outwards, spitting metal and debris into the sky. The steel beams of the cabin floor above the cargo hold blew apart. Within three seconds, the upper fuselage began to tear away in huge strips that unwrapped above the passengers, and chunks of metal, support ribs, and torn cabling hit the fan blades of number two engine, causing flame out. The plane rolled left, and as more of the skin was stripped away, the forward fuselage and cockpit separated from the body of the plane and plummeted nose first. The disintegrating body of the plane tipped and yawed and began to descend. Debris hit and destroyed the empennage. The wing structures also broke away, taking with them sections of adjacent seating. The first wing section hit the ground at 150 miles per hour, pulverising all of those passengers still attached to it. No bodies were ever found. The second wing section landed at an angle which threw out some passengers. The man's legs were sliced off and the majority of his head and upper torso would be found some metres away from the crash site scattered in the extremities of another's corpse. Hundreds of smaller fragments were spread across the site and clothes filled the sky, blotting out the stars, fluttering down on the ruins of the plane, garish bolts of colour against the white fuselage livery. Football shirts, ripped jeans, blouses of all shades, and a child's superhero costume. Okay, so a bit of a trope, bit of a trope. Um, let's have a look at the genius room, always right, never wrong. Um, and initial reactions, I think, were pretty good, actually, to the title and the blurb. Um, and then it didn't, then it went a bit downhill. Eva says, decent blurb. Matt says, solid blurb. Not surprising, maybe, but solid. Um, James says, good title, interesting blurb. Uh, Annie says, well, this is kind of when it started to turn. I sense a prologue, writing is a bit distant. Um, Ed says, not the right place to start. Johnny, our narrator, this is always interesting to hear from the person who gets into the, the reading itself, felt it needed an edit. And James says, no bang that a thriller needs at the beginning. Let's see what Jeff felt about that. Uh, I thought the, the, good, the writer was good. There was some good tension there. Um, I also, yeah, I think the one thing that worried me really is the you we got really into investing in the time to actually learn about this particular uh, character, and he blows up at the end of it, and he's gone. Yeah. So to me, yeah. unless something, you know, unless there's something connecting to the next part, it seems to be that. that, any, that, that but didn't you know he was going to blow up in any case? I kind of felt yeah, that right from the beginning. Yeah, I did. So I realised yeah. that, but I thought about maybe something at the end of that particular chapter and say carry it on from something else as well. It may be his line 700, 800, whatever, but so I thought it was just very, very sudden that that's it, it's gone. But, so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, also, I mean, there were talk of bombs in the luggage bag, um, luggage hole, and I, mean, I thought there would have been security checks to actually stop that happening. That's the usual thing. Everything, every bag is scanned. I don't know, if that was, I don't know when this was actually the, the, the date of this particular, uh, when it happened. Yeah. In the bar, but, uh, that seemed to be a bit lacking so that well, if, detail, I, if, they, yeah, if they had scanned the luggage of course then the whole book would not happen so exactly you know. when being uh, there <laughs> yes as far as well, so, they do actually scan every bag yeah. goes on the, bit of a fatal thought yeah. maybe uh Chantal yeah, says very good studio, writing so. i'm just not engaged ed says no i get it but this is a prologue um and panna says really needs the reader's digest version way too much detail not enough action what did you think will yeah, I, thought, I, I agreed with the, the genie, genie I, that the beginning was a bit flat and I got engaged, I started to get engaged when the bomb went off. Uh, I thought the writing there was very immediate. Mm -hmm. Love the use of verbs. It's really happening. Um, good stuff. I would lose that beginning. The guy's going to die anyway. Yeah. I'm kind of willing to suspend disbelief on the luggage, but it would have to be from an airport that was a bit dodgy to start with. And there are those in, still in the world. Um, oh, yeah. I believe. Not many, yeah. but, yeah. you know. Yeah. 
And Good. then if that's the ins- if that's the kickoff incident, then you know who's picking up the mess and why does it matter? Yeah, yeah. I mean, an awful lot of things do start with a bang, don't they? Is this is this, this sort of doesn't mm-hmm. it doesn't fill my heart with joy and excitement to read the rest of the book, but. I don't know. Maybe, mm. maybe I'm just a gloomy old agent. Uh, Will, have you got the um, voting sorted out? Just need to make sure it's working for you technically. Let's go. Just do I press your votes now. You haven't no. Oh, oh! I just um. Yeah. What have you done? Oh no. Oh no! This is long. I, 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 oh. I don't think. Have you got the page? I don't open? think I'm set. Okay. I don't think I'm set up on that. I've never been set up. It's my first time. Carry on without me. Okay, right. I'm going to ask you. We're going to do this live on air, so no one accuses okay. of, of, of cheating. So I am going to ask you. Um, hopefully not each time, but I'm going to ask you right now. And I'm going to enter the data so everyone can see that we are doing this the correct way. Um, all right. So title. You you can give anything from one to five stars for the title. Five meaning bleeding fantastic. One meaning otherwise. What are you going to give it? Three. Three, okay, all right. And for the blurb itself, would it make you want to read the book and buy it? Mm, two. Two. The writing craft, you like those verbs? I did, mm, but only that part. Um, three. Three, okay. And Bang, which is the commercial potential. Do you think this is a book that actually has got lots of commercial potential or not much? Not much. Basically, not much, okay. And that's going to be a... Two. A two, fantastic. I read your mind on that. Good. All right. There we go. You see, it's 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 all it's all coming up there. there. And you've got... We've got a total uh, number. Let's have a look at the uh, the total score, AJ2. You've got 57, which is not bad. Not bad at all. Um, voting very, very similar across both our guests and the Genius Room, which gives me great encouragement, actually. Let's go straight on and uh, have submission number two. Here we go. So much number two comes from Peter. Peter Vast. I think that's a great name. I might give extra points just for a, a very cool authorial name. Peter Vast, best-selling author. It's, it's got to say that on your visiting card. It's, it's brilliant. And of course, there's a QR code. That, yeah, see, so you've got support from Will. There's a QR code there too. So you can scan that and go to what I assume will be Peter's website, but it could be any link at all, actually. And it's called The Ticket Thriller. This is Peter's blurb. Their very, very last thought was that this was probably for the best. The golden straw-coloured dunes and the clear, deep blue sky faded away, and the once immaculate, untouched beauty was now forever stained with blood. Lots and lots of blood. It's 1985, South Australia. A group of friends head off on a camping trip. It's the eve of the state's first million-dollar ex-lotto draw. And one of the couples has a ticket. What could possibly go wrong? A lot is the answer. A lot. I'll get the hint. Let me tell everybody, everyone about you, Peter. I work as an accountant and analyst and started writing a couple of years ago. Like many things in my life, I wonder why I didn't start doing this thing that I love much, much earlier on. In any case, I'm making my way slowly in the world of writing and I'm learning a lot. I've self-published my first novel, a dystopian sci-fi thriller, and I'm currently plotting the sequel while actively looking at ways to promote my work. My writing is dark, quirky, and is not for the faint-hearted. Excellent. That means we're right up our street, that is. And you need a virtuoso reading from our very own Robert. The Ticket by Peter. Read by Robert. Prologue. As the cord tightened around his neck, and his vision started to blur, a thought, or was it a quote, surfaced in his mind. Life is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. It seemed appropriate. Deep down, he knew that it was all over. He hadn't asked for any of this to happen. It just wasn't fair. The ticket, he thought. This is all the ticket's fault. He tried to take in a breath, 
but it was too late. The cord was too tight, he couldn't get his fingers underneath it, and his energy, his will to live, was draining away by the second. There was something else, trying to fight its way up from the depths of his subconscious. One last fleeting thing, and he focused, trying to make it reveal itself, as if somehow it might help him out of his desperate situation. Breathing was next to impossible, and his arms felt weak as the cord cut still into his neck, crushing his windpipe. A song! That was the thing. That was all. It was nothing that would help him. He heard the first few chords ring out in his mind, and would have smiled if it were possible to smile while the life was being strangled out of him. The opening bars of Ganga Jang's Sounds of Then rang out, then skipped through to the chorus. As his vision turned black, his very, very last thought was that this was probably for the best. The golden straw-coloured dunes and the clear, deep blue sky faded away. A once immaculate, untouched beauty was now forever stained with blood. Lots and lots of blood. Chapter 1. The Tarago. I bloody hate camping! Miranda threw the folding chairs down with unnecessary gusto. She was not in the least bit impressed with the opportunity to spend a couple of nights at the remote but beautiful Innes National Park. Damn you, Jackie and Shane, she thought, always wanting to go away somewhere for their birthdays. Why do they have to invite everybody? Why do they have to invite us? Greg just grinned, his usual default army issue grin, and continued strapping their bags and equipment to the large cage on the roof of his brand new metallic bronze Tarago R20 Town Ace. It was his pride and joy, and he'd washed and polished it first thing this morning, even though he knew the van would be covered in dirt and dust by the time they got to the campground. First impressions and all that. Why can't we just go and have a nice dinner at Sizzler or something instead? Miranda was almost whining now, and Greg had been putting up with her relentless complaints for the last hour. They're your friends, Mir. Anyway, it'll be fun. A couple of days camping, getting away from it all. It'll be great. He was doing his best to try and convince her, but he knew that she'd much rather work at the fitness club, watch a movie, and go to church on Sunday, just like they did every other weekend. Greg didn't mind the idea of roughing it for a few nights. He hadn't had the chance to go bush for quite a while now, the last time being a two-week training camp at Pukapunyal with his regiment sometime last year. The opportunity of some R&R &R was exactly what they needed, as far as he was concerned. Fun? Fun? What part of sleeping on an uncomfortable air mattress, getting bitten by mozzies, with no TV, no hairdryer, no shower, and having to use a long drop toilet, do you call fun exactly? Miranda was practically stamping her foot now, and he thought that he'd better give her his full attention. Come on, love. It won't all be bad. Maybe we can try and make babies while we're here there. He grinned. Miranda blushed and threw the pillow she was holding at his head with surprising force and accuracy. He ducked, but wasn't quick enough, and it ricocheted off his head and flopped onto the cracked bitumen of their unit's parking bay. Let me just say, Peter, really like the presentation on that. Um, and, you know, you, you may be scratching your head now. Lots of people may be sort of saying, why is that Peter Cox saying you like the presentation? Because actually, if you, if you present your work nicely, you know, think about it. Friday afternoon, 50 submissions to read. Just want to get home, really. And, you know, some of them look so horrible. They're just, just un uninteresting, uninspiring. But I thought, I thought that was a really nice presentation. The only thing I would say is maybe don't, uh, don't justify. Just let it uh, range left. But um, it's, not, you know, visually nice to look at. Let's hear straight from Will. First impressions, Will. Yep, I think the, the blood needs attention. Um, you know, I, I picked up several cliches like clear blue sky or deep blue sky yeah stained with blood uh, think of another way of saying that make it more interesting grab us mm. by the belt buckle up front we need Ooh. that right and otherwise i quite like the premise i like the premise of a lottery ticket you know as the subject for murder mm. which is presumably what's going to happen out there in the bush well i certainly hope so i've wasted my money well indeed 
Yeah. And the, the setup in the home, I thought, was a little bit flat, a little bit boring. If they, why don't they argue about not whether she wants to go, but whether she's packed, not packed something that will turn out to be vital, or he's not packed something that will turn out to be vital to their survival? I mean, set it up early, pay it off late. You know, get us in there. Good, excellent. We'll be back to you for a vote in a moment. Um, meanwhile, let's hear from Jeff. Yeah, I thought so. I think the, 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 we start the um, I thought the beginning bit, the actual like, priority part of it, was 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 good. It was well written. Um, I was quite interested. I was getting quite keen to find out what's happening. I didn't mention the ticket there. Um, but then we get was when we get to chapter one, it's a complete change of pace and everything else. Then I think it went a bit flat after that. It did, didn't so, it? Yeah. 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 I think Peter thought, oh, I've hooked you with the prologue now. You know, you're going to plow through a few fairly dull chapters. Big mistake, exactly, actually. Yeah. yeah, it's like a, a rocket. I always say it's like a rocket. You know, you've got to, you, you can't just rely on the first stage. You've got to, the booster's got to kick in. It's got to go even faster, even more powerful, exactly. and e even more. And, you know, that's how, that's how we, we keep people turning the page, is what you've got to do. Um, I didn't get, didn't get the USP, really. I mean, there's, okay, it's the last lottery ticket. At the moment, to me, to be honest, it does feel a bit like genre writing. Uh, which is fair enough. There's a market for genre thrillers, but what agents are mostly looking for is is the 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 big new idea, really, the thing that people are going to put down the big money for. I'm not quite getting that. Um, let's just look at the genius room. Um, set it up early, says Lex. Pay it off late. Great advice, actually. As Chekhov's gun. Um, Stacey says, based on, on this bit, I think the first part of the blurb needs some revision. There's all this focus on blood. A lot of blood, yes. But the first chapter is setting up the relationship between two characters quite so. Let's just go back to Will and I'm going to get your numbers, please, if, I'm, if I can, sir, for title. Mm, out of, what was it, out of five? Yep. Um, the ticket, um, two. Two, okay. Yeah, it's a little bit flat, isn't it? Uh, blurb? Two. Two again. Craft, the writing craft itself, irrespective of its commercial potential. Mm, two. Two, and its commercial potential, the bang. Yeah, three. Three, jolly good. Excellent, thank you very much. And those numbers have gone straight in there. Um, I think at this stage in the game, I think we need to get to know Will a little bit more. Let's ask... Let's ask Will some basic questions about Will. Will, what's all this about you? <laughs> about you and the Cod War? Uh oh! Come yes. on, guys. Been reading your website. Look here. We, here it is to prove it. Actually, here we are. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's, been... it's on the website. It's got to be true. What happened? Yeah, I was a baby sailor sent to defend Britain's cod. Uh, not back in time for tea mills. Freezing cold. Yes. Uh, cold enough that your hands stuck to the railings oh my um, God. and your toes fell off, uh, yes. icebergs. And we weren't, although you can see, we, if you look at that piece of video, we ram, we do ram the, uh, or try and ram the Icelandic uh, gunboats. They won't let us shell it. So we keep asking the MOD in London, can we open fire? Because after all, there are cod. <laughs> and they keep <laughs> saying no. So. For all of that effort and freezing cold and pleurisy my mate had, and arthritis oh at the age of 19, he had, uh, another guy had, um, we lost, we, I think we lost that war. Or it was a score draw, I'm not sure. I think it was a draw. And no, and no yes. medal. I think the no cod medals. lost. The hu humans kind of won, cod lost. I think a small cod-shaped medal would have done it for me, you know. I see. And, and what tender I, age were yeah. you when, when all this was happening? Oh God, that would be revealing a lot, wouldn't it? I was young. Oh. It's so so long ago, I can't remember. Well, it, uh, your website remembers for you, and you were beneath yeah, the age okay. majority, definitely, definitely. Yeah, definitely, yeah. Yeah, which must mean you you misled one or two people to run away to sea, which is a classic beginning of any story. And from then, I mean, I, there's so much of interest to talk to you about. Really, you won a scholarship. Went to Oxford and become a youth worker. I want to pick up this this time with Reuters, Reuters TV. You say you say something really interesting about that. You said it taught you basic skills and writing clear, engaging, and often grammatical English. How did that happen? Well, we would get um, a news story in. Let's say it was the war in the, the Israeli, the war with, between the Israelis and the uh, Palestinians in Beirut, hmm. and it was raw footage, and you had to write a story to it. That was 
my original mm. job. And so because you're dealing with like a three minute news clip, all of that's got to get information across really fast, really succinctly and grab you uh, so that and, and write to the pictures. And oh, I was very lucky to have on the uh, sub editor's desk a succession of really good, mostly Commonwealth, mostly Canadian, News Kiwi, uh, one American, and, and a couple of Brits, but very, very good sub editors who yeah. just looked at my stuff and tore it up and chucked it in the bin and made me write it again and again uh, until, you know, it, was, it resembled something interesting yes. and relevant yes. and told the story, you know, to the pictures. Yeah. Excellent training, so, isn't it? excellent, excellent boot camp training. It was a, it was a tr tried by fire, really. Yeah. yeah, we've got lots of questions for you. Actually, uh, I'm just going to. I'm, I think we're going to come back and talk to you again after the next submission, actually, because there's so much to ask you about. Uh, I've got a question from Hannah saying, "Which did you do first, uh, ghostwriting or writing your own books? And do you find that one helps the other?" The, the last question is definitely a yes because. It's the same. It's the same craft, and writing is a craft. You need to practice it every day, um, or almost every day. Uh, the answer to the first bit was yes. Uh, ghostwriting came first. Um, uh, yeah, ghostwriting was first. The, the the boys who were shot down in in the Iraq War. Yeah. The yeah, man. Yeah. Fantastic. We're we're going to come and pick up the Will Pearson story again in a moment. But now we've got submission number three. And it's that's quite a genre here. Let me let me uh, go to the genre first: psychological thriller slash family saga slash online really? fishing story. And I'm I'm not sure what that means. Is it on is that like fishing story as in COD Wars? Wouldn't that be spooky? Or is it an <laughs> online fishing story? I don't know. <laughs> we'll we'll right. get the cases of doing this on purpose. Can but you mentioned the COD War again. Yes, um, uh, this romance is. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't know we'll find out okay. we'll find out okay. don't worry it's from bill lee and it's called a game of inches it's called a game of inches and this is bill's blurb a game of inches could fall into the categories of a psychological thriller inspired by an actual crime it's roughly ninety nine thousand five hundred. In what is like the year or something and is set in new york city of the late 1980s i don't understand that at all uh, through the 2010s. So what is that, that number, 99,500? Don't get that. One of the two to three main characters, oh, um, who each speaks in the first person, is a law student from New Zealand who is hard at work setting herself up for a horrendous crime, similar to the one that helped inspire the book, Working as an Online Hooker. Right, so I think, don't think that's only to do with the Cod War. Um, let me tell, us, tell you about the... It's the last time I mentioned that, by the way. Uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> so good. I think we have vast uh, guest the session's, in, the session's improving, yeah. Good. It's getting better. <laughs> He's marking me. Um, once a denizen of the pre-Disney world, Williamsburg, Brooklyn. This is all about Bill. The Ooh. author was never in Vietnam, as was his character, Bill Lee, until now. Okay. He was a New York City jazz musician. Okay, so uh, what, your character is called Biddle, Biddle Lee. Your name is Bill Lee. Is this a bit of Nick Cage stuff current going on? I'm not sure. Uh, it could be the word count, Chantel. It could be. Oh my God. I hope not. Um, he was a New York City uh, jazz musician performing mainly in restaurants such as the Antique Garage, <laughs> bars such as Teddy's Bar and Grill and Williamsburg, and nightclubs such as Nell's back in the day. Wow. Well, that's all, that's all amazing, really, and uh, we're going to have the most amazing reading you've ever had in your whole life, I do declare, Bill, from our very own Beverly. A Game of Inches, or The Further Adventures of Behemoth and Kiroviev, by Bill Lee, read by Bev. Prologue. Towards the tail end of an 18-year career, as a GED teacher and then an absent teacher reserve in the enigmatic school system of the City of a Thousand Schools, the author of most of these pages had fallen into a severe, really quite dangerous depression. It wasn't the kids in the school in the City of a Thousand Schools, and it wasn't the other teachers, even though some of them were totally nuts. There were still some left who were just fat, lazy fucks who knew they'd always be protected by their union. 
but it was the administrators. H didn't know where they got these people from, but they were some of the worst people he had ever come in contact with in his entire life, worse than some of the officers in Vietnam. In Vietnam, at least some of the officers cared about their men. These fucks didn't care about anybody except themselves, not the teachers, and least of all the kids, although they would preach that the other way around if you ever gave them the opportunity. Some of these administrators, and these were a minority, had started out by teaching themselves, but they got the hell out of the classroom as fast as they could by becoming administrators. He didn't know why it worked this way, whether this type gravitates towards these positions, or whether it's the system that turns perfectly good people into monsters. Possibly it is the fact that most of them have compromised. They know they're working with a system that is underfunded and has been relegated to the back burner by most of the rest of society. Therefore they just go with the flow and glibly promote whatever the latest silver bullet is that will fix the whole problem. And this year too, group work, a common, core curriculum, using primary sources, critical thinking, etc, etc, etc. Just to be clear, it's as if it had never occurred to some people that along with the biblical promise that he who receives one little child in my name shall receive me, there might very well be an equal and opposite proscription. And indeed there is, and this also is written. In Vietnam there would be nights when one or two army colonels would fly into a fire base at dusk, evict the grunts from the best, most well-constructed, most secure bunker on the base, and spend the night there. The kids who built the bunker might have somehow gotten hold of a steel I-beam, or maybe dragged some huge logs in from the bush, piling sandbags on top of the logs. But these bastards didn't care. They'd fly out at dawn and write themselves up for medals for having exposed themselves without regard to their own personal safety to grave danger and blah blah blah. This would count towards the next promotion and they might even get an actual medal out of it too. The man had seen that happen more than once. Like Stalin at Koroshevo. This is why higher ranking officers love wars. Those guys didn't have to worry about getting fragged. The lieutenants had to worry about getting fragged or shot in the back, which just made them better officers. In the end, he had to get up and try to pull himself together or he was just not going to make it. He was going to die, literally, because he had already started losing his mind. This is often the last thing that happens to you before you die, and he had seen it happen enough times. In this case, death is a relief. Losing one's mind completely, he knew, was something that happened to people under severe torture or who had been confined to bed rest for a very long time. Under the Chinese torture known as slicing or death by a thousand cuts, where the torturer starts by distending the muscles in the feet, continuing by slicing them into the thinnest possible slices, like Paul Savino slicing garlic in the prison scene in Goodfellas, the victim will sometimes end up holding both sides of some imaginary conversation in a cracked, croaking voice, like two five-dollar whores arguing across the hallway in a five-dollar whorehouse. I like that line. I like that last line, actually. Um, I, the presentation is, is blowing people's minds in the chat room. Let's just go and have a look. And it's just, uh, I mean, I guess there is an isolated possibility that the file became a bit distorted in uh you know in transit which is actually if you're worried about that send a pdf guys you know you you know that what you send is exactly what's going to be seen then um johnny says rather distancing not engaging status says i feel like there are many possible stories within the content of this just not seeing a single one clearly Chantal, mm -hmm. why is everyone the man today and he says authors should bring this to the colony clearly not starting the right in, in the right place uh, quite a bit of author opinions in here, says RK, intruding the story. Pamela, uh, writer needs to work with an editor, the, oh, is that right, or, or a therapist? Uh, the ideas in his head aren't making it to paper. <laughs> well, all right, so discount what I just said about therapist, because I think in there, I'm, the, the biggest uh, mark I've given for this is for craft. The rest I've marked really quite low. I have given this a three for craft, because I think there's a voice in there, and I think that voice deserves to be developed. Yes. But let's get some hard-headed opinion here from will yeah i i wish i could agree with you more but i can't i'm lacking the voice i i i want somebody to hook on to i want somebody and something happening which tells me straight away 
about this person and what's going on and what matters in their lives or yeah. about their character. Let's take Spider-Man 1, which is an absolute gem of story construction. So Spider-Man, we pick him up running for the bus and the other kids are trying to stop him getting on the bus, you remember? He's a loser. He gets on the bus, they trip him up, etc. So immediately we know that this guy has a problem and his main problem is himself. So, yeah, I'm going to stop ranting now, but I agree with Andy D. It felt like a bit of a rant about Vietnam and school. Yeah, yeah, it did. It, it was a bit of a rant, that's right. But I, I was picking up a ranty voice, but who knows. Uh, let's get some numbers from you. Well, title? I think the title's good. Um, okay. Four. Four! Fantastic. Best, best vote so far, actually, today. Blurb. <clears throat> One. One. Ooh, not good. Craft. Two. Two. And commercial potential, otherwise known as bang. One. One. Okay. Well, that's quite quite an interesting mixture there. What did you make to it, Jeff? Well, I can't really add much more than what's been said before, but I just found it, it was like a rant to me. We could seem to be going from school administrators to Bible references, Vietnam, China, and then what end up with the other stuff, stuff as well about prostitutes. Yeah. I don't know what we're, we're aiming for. There, was, there is a story then. I agree, there's a, there, is, there is a small voice there, I think, but it just it was so confusing to me. You know, to, to, to me, you know, to, I, I wouldn't have, would have read it and put it that way. Yeah, yeah, and Andy's just said in the genius room, I suspect there's a lot of good imagery here. I thought that last line was, was I could see that. I could definitely see that. Uh, and prose yeah. too, but it needs some structure and discipline to make it work. Um, yeah, yeah, okay. So let's look at the overall numbers on that. <gasps> Is that all so far? Oh, no. That's not great, Bill. Sorry about that. Um, you've divided people a lot today. We hold you entirely responsible for divisions. You got a 36 that can change over the next few minutes as the genius room decides to vote a bit more, sometimes vote a bit less. So be prepared for anything to happen. Let's look at uh, the, the numbers so far. With three submissions down, it's very clear that AJT, AJT James is in the lead with the other infidel, but we have two more submissions to go, last of the month, so very, very significant. We have a question in for you. Will, we've got several questions in. This is from John, John Bertel. He wants to know what sparked your interest in unexplained mysteries? What's the most mysterious mystery you've, uh, you've ever come across? And I think we can show that because that's, is that your most recent book? It's certainly a, a big one on the website there. Yeah, it is. It is the, the, the latest. It's, it's yeah. not that new, but it's, it's a couple of years ago. So what sparked um, your interest? What sparked my interest was yeah. a commission from... Oh, right. Uh, <laughs> from, for money, from Alan Samson. For money, Ryan. Yeah, the money. Oh, yeah, bless yeah, him, you know that, bless him. Yes. Yeah, the whole thing getting paid to write. Uh, yeah, just, I remember that well. Yes, people used to get yeah. paid to write. Nice. I okay. think you got... So uh, my biggest mystery uh, was where we lived in Ealing. There was lots of, quite a, I'm not a great believer in the supernatural or ghosts. However, there were a series of uh, things that happened around where we lived, which were hard to explain hmm. and which seemed to indicate some sort of supernatural presence, though I never saw it myself. All right. But, 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 very, but various neighbors did. And, you know, so yeah. that's, that's hmm. the answer. And there you go. And is it is it one of those vast sort of compilation books, uh, like, um, oh dear, who, who was it? Charles no. Fort, wasn't it? Charles Fort type stuff. No, it's 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 it's, like it's almost like stories, Ealing. and there there are a bunch of short stories. And you know, I, I don't write vast compilation books, so, so I, some of them I could choose, but most of them were stuck onto me, like you know, the old faves, like the Mary Celeste. So I tried to yeah. find new angles on that, and I was lucky to find one or two things on the Mary Celeste which, which mm. were interesting, and you know, and try to inject some sort of yeah, yeah. extra fuel yeah. into the yeah. into the yeah. yeah. So that was I'm my sure task. I'm sure you did. Well, John also wants to know: Do you have any tips on writing action scenes? <sighs> yeah, read Big one. read Shakespeare and look at the way he uses verbs. I mean, verbs are the key, absolutely. And do not write long sentences if hmm. there's a fight going on, you know, obviously hmm. 
with rare exceptions, that, that's just not going to work. So punchy sentences, very plain, engaging, straightforward Saxon English, that's to say not lots of Latinate words. Hold up on the adverbs as well. They are slowing down words. Um, what else can I tell you? This that's, is brilliant. A, this, the, we, we ought to bottle this and sell it, actually. This is, is, that's is, a start. This is brilliant advice. Look, I, I did a bit more digging on your website, and you're not going to thank me for, for, me for this. I've done so much. No, digging. it's okay. I, I'm cool, really. I'm fine. I don't even mind about the Cod War. I just oh. mind about the medal. All right. Nothing I do about that. Um, I found this, <laughs> this brilliant quote from you, actually. It's uh, this is you on 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 writing. It's nonfiction, right? So this it's all about getting to the heart of the story, injecting energy and pace, and honing yeah. and shaping so that it grips us and moves us and makes us a part of it. Now that seems yeah. to go to the heart, really, of what you do, you know, and, yeah, and, and why your writing has been so well, successful. How do you do that? Do. Is it is it as simple as just opening up a vein and and getting on with it? Or how how do you do that? No, I, it goes back to what we were talking about before, which is that I had some good teachers, and you need those when you're writing. You need mm -hmm. people who know what they're talking about, and you need to read a lot. That, that's something Lee Child always says. You know, he reads constantly. He reads other thriller writers. He reads classics. He reads, you know, a bunch of stuff to keep your, all your linguistic centers firing. Um, yeah. That's brilliant hey. advice. Thank you very much. We're going to come back even one more time because we've still got more questions to ask you but right now things are hotting up in the submissions area this is submission number four it's from matt matt talbot that name's familiar qr code there too quite a long one i think um it's interesting it's the more complex though the longer the uh, the url uh you can't unfire a grim a grim what is that a fairy tale Interesting. You can't unfire a grim. I don't know. You could fire a grim. Um, it's commercial fiction, action slash adventure thriller. Right up Will Street. Let's see how he reacts to it. To the blurb. <laughs> this novel is a mashup of Spider-Man. He's he. Will just said Spider-Man just a few moments hey, ago. More synchronous. Rock and roll, man. More cod wars. I can't believe it. <laughs> we get we get accused of all sorts of things, but it's all synchronicity. A mashup of Spider-Man and Apocalypse Now. Hank wants to be a normal young child, don't we all? His father wants Hank to join the US Marine Corps. While trying to escape the sphere of his father, he runs into narco-terrorists yeah. who kill for fun. Hank wishes he knew a techno genius that sat in an ominously dark room who could vector SAS commandos mm. or release some ninjas his way to save the day. Alone as he's ever been, Hank must somehow rely on guts and determination to survive. Good. Sounds entertaining. Um, this novel is based upon entirely too much reality from my own life, says Matt. My friends are continuously amazed that I survived my youth. As an adult, I'm an avid reader who is tired of formulaic books. No, I could write better, so I did. Fantastic motivation. Special note. The not, I, I'm not sure I, I like the special note. Special note. The novel what? starts with a cliche. Right. Uh, waking up. I can revise the cliche if the cliche offends, but note it resonates well with all test readers. I'm not sure you should have to write a note like that, a cover note. But anyway, uh, message received and understood. And talking about good resonance, here is a brilliant reading from our very own Barbara. You Can't Unfire a Grim by Matt Talbot, read by Barbara. One, darkest before the dawn. The hyenas were asleep. The cage door was closed and locked. The sun was beating down without mercy. My face was wet. I... Two, hell, a bad place to be. I had been passed out for what felt like a long time. I forced my eyes open. My brain told me to keep them shut. It was right. I was at the end of a 10 by 20 foot cage. At the other end of the cage were three hyenas. Stop. Verify. Confirm. Three large hyenas. Trying not to move, I looked around for an escape. The cage was made of welded rebar sunk into a dusty concrete floor. A 
are focused on the door. The large padlock I thought I had dreamt was real. No hope of escape there. The cage had a plywood lean-to across from the door in the middle with a frayed blanket hanging down the front. It was a poor excuse of a shelter from the unyielding sun for any unlucky occupants. There were no occupants. Sitting next to me was my dog and best friend, Ziki. He and the hyenas were violently panting and drooling. I reached out to Ziki. He was burning hot to the touch. His dark fur was absorbing the unrelenting sun. I tried to stand up. Hanging on to the rebar, I managed to achieve near vertical status by ignoring the pain that racked every part of my body. Ziki was visibly relieved by my action. After he verified that I managed to remain erect, he lay down in exhaustion. As I gained focus, I noticed that his ear was ripped. He had blood splattered all over his head and shoulders, and he had a large gash to the bone on his left front leg. He licked his leg between every few pants. That did little to stop the flies that were swarming all over him. It was then understood that the lean-to in the middle of the cage was no man's land and Seki had saved my life. I looked at my watch. It was 15.10, on a blistering Texas afternoon in July. The fight was currently five against the sun, but I knew from the way the hyenas were staring, as soon as the sun went down, it would be three against two. Based on both the way I felt and Zeki's leg, it would be not much of a fight. I was trying to figure a way out of this hell when I heard a cackle, and then it all came back to me. I hadn't been vertical for long when I had my first visitor. The voice from the encounter at my jeep spoke to me. Hey, amigo, I was beginning to worry about you. I cocked my head to look at him. I tried to talk, but only managed to scratch out. Why's that? I thought you might not wake up until too late. That would be no fun for my pets. This was clearly hilarious to him as he started to cackle uncontrollably. We both looked at the hyenas at the other end of the cage. I processed everyone knew how this was going to play out, and everyone seemed to be looking forward to the outcome but me. Two of his buddies came up to share in the moment. My being erect was clearly a bonus for all. The dirtier of the two new guys spoke. Hey amigo, you never heard of motion sensors? This comment was met with gut-wrenching cackle fest and an equally insane display of gold dental work. It was too much to take. I closed my eyes tight and slid to the ground. This helped my throbbing head a little, but did nothing to shut out the steady stream of cackling visitors. The cackling wanker fest continued intermittently until the scorching heat took over. I kept my eyes shut. I desperately needed a plan. Any plan. My dad always said nothing is over until you give up. Grimms never give up. I had never given up. Ever. Think, Grim. Think. Well, lots and lots of reactions in the genius room. I think uh, we should go straight to them and see what's what. Um, people are still talking about your your uh, world's quite actually brilliant quote, says Hannah. Um, Kate uh, says, yes, yeah, Stephen King is another strong advocate of read, read, read. Yeah. Barbara likes the title, Hannah likes the title. Ed says, SAS and American Marines. Mm -hmm. uh, Matt, almost not quite with the blurb. Hannah likes the blurb. Um, Andy says, is it me or do a lot of our blurbs today seem a bit unhinged? And James says, uh, you're unhinged? Uh, <laughs> uh, Matt says, strong opening, well done. RK says, I've read shorter chapters, Andy. Waking up isn't that bad. This is about the, the apology for a, a cliche. Um, it, if he's waking in a cage, and Johnny echoes that point, says, I don't think I'd have noticed the trope if the author hadn't highlighted it. Um, and then some practical questions. Hannah says, why did he not try to move, then try to stand up? And Andy says, I like the writing. This doesn't quite match the blur. What did you think, Will? Yeah, I agree with Matt Sko there on the Genius Room. I thought it was a good, strong, uh, pretty strong. Well done. Yeah. Good. I mean, uh, mm, well done. Well, shall we do some numbers, you and me together? Um, normally, we okay. don't do this. Next time you come on, if you come on again, um, we, we'll, we give you a little link and you can just press your own buttons. But on this occasion... Yeah, if I had technical support, it would be fine from yes, you guys. I, I, yeah. 
All right. We'll, we'll send someone around next time. We've got, we've got official yeah, yeah. button pushers. Um, with a, title. With a hammer, yeah. Yeah, exactly. G give us, uh, give us a number. Title, oh, yeah. The title's really interesting. Uh, it's intriguing. It is strange, isn't it? Uh, I mean, it, 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 it didn't say to me thriller. It said to me fairy tale because of yes. the Brothers Grimm. So there yes. is that conflict of, yeah. Uh, I'm not sure about it. I, I like it, and there, there are things that make me pause for a thriller title yeah all right so uh you, how many how many give three. us a number three okay and three. uh the blurb please um yeah four. Ooh, generous indeed um craft good four nice choppy wow. sentences wow verbs verb usage pretty good structure wow. wasn't bad Wow, mostly ang Anglo-Saxon too. Um, and bang, commercial potential. Yeah, it's hard to tell without knowing more about the story, but at least yeah. a three. A three, mm. fair enough. Okay, that's that's pretty good going for Will actually, because Will always shoots from the shoulder. Um, what did you What do you think, Jeff? Jeff. Hello, Jeff. Yeah, yeah yes. sorry, I just, I just went off and froze for a while. And I really liked that. I enjoyed that. I thought it was a good, a good bit, of, bit of writing. It was, um, oh, it was, it was, it was some tension in there. It was a good voice and things. Yeah, it was, it was quite so refreshing to, to after the other ones. Um, yeah, well, yeah, I enjoyed it. And um, I'd like to carry on reading it as well. Just oh, three nice. of what, Very what good. happened with the, Excellent. Bottom, the actual uh, piece themselves. Fantastic. Good. And you've given some good marks there, too, particularly commercial yeah. aspect of it. That's very good. Let's look at the numbers so far. Matt, you should be quite happy. You've got a 60. I think you're probably in the lead today, are you? Let's have a look and look, see how things look before our final submission. You are. You are, actually. Yeah, you've, you've dashed into the lead for today's show, but not for the monthly winner yet. And if you remember, that's a whacking great 74. That's going to be very hard to beat. And maybe, maybe our final submission can do that before. Then we have two more questions to Will. Uh, Katie Allen says, Tom Clancy, RIP, wrote a techno thriller book, Command Authority, co-authored and published posthumously in which he's uh, way back actually in 2013, uh, in which he seems to envision Putin's present actions. What are your thoughts on the idea of the writer as shaman, phenomenon of fiction as a reading or preempting of a zeitgeist prophecy, writers as prophets of a change in the wind? I think that's a really interesting and fun question. I, I can't help, start, I mean, when I worked at Reuters, we, we were predicting the fall of the wall 18 months mm. two years and this yeah. sounds like you know we're being like i'm boasting but it wasn't me so much it was you know, it was everybody the journalists could see that coming 18 months before the berlin wall came down mm. it was just it was going to happen but the cia could not the, when you read funny. when you I'm read funny. their reports uh -huh. there was absolutely no indication that for all of the hundreds of agents they had Mm. in Russia, you know, and, and all the money they had and the resources, yeah. they did not see it coming. So yeah. I think writers do sometimes foresee um, uh, world events. I was just trying to think of an example. I'll come back to you if I can think of it. There is a good okay. one. Yeah. Well, I'm sure I'm sure the Genius Room agrees with you because we have several distinguished journalists in the Genius Room today. Uh, but we've got another question from Galadriel, who is talking now about, because you've done some translation as well. You, you yeah. don't, of course, you. You don't, you don't talk about that much, but we're going to get you talking talk about that right now because Galadriel says, how do you approach your translations of books such as Kafka's Metamorphosis? Was there anything he had to, you had to, regard in terms of nuance of language that would make them more accessible to the contemporary reader? And if so, how do you go about balancing your own interpretation with preserving the original author's voice? I, I mean, again, that's a that's an interesting and quite tough question. I mean, mm. anybody who's ever done any translation, catching that voice is really difficult. And the, and the the, the 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 line between staying true to the actual language the author uses, the actual you know meaning, well, you have to get the meaning, but the language, yes. and allowing yourself to express it in your own language so that it's engaging, is that's the challenge. Mm. In the case of Kafka. It was a great help to me that, it, you know, he, write, he writes in what I was talking about earlier, somebody asked about um, writing, and he writes in very plain Saxon English. He doesn't use any, I'm not saying long words are bad, 
but he doesn't beat around the bush. His sentences are very direct, language is clear, plain, concise, and that was a, a gift really for any translator. In, in, and of course, German to English, you know, yeah, that's the, there is a correspondence there to start with anyway. Yeah, yeah. yeah Even yeah. more so with Frisian, isn't it? Frisian apparently, it, you know, most English people can kind of understand it. Really? I didn't know I've that. Heard. Yeah, apparently it's, it's that close, but only about 500 people speak of that. Um, you've never been tempted to do beer, Wolf, have you? I, yeah, I, I read, have tried you? to read Beowulf. Um, my wife did Anglo-Saxon, so she thrust it at me. Um, I think it's a great story, wonderful story. I've never tried to do it. That's good. interesting, yeah. Mm. Don't, don't, don't. No. It's, it's, it's never a good okay. sign when an author does that. They so they just get, they get lost in their own sort of self and importance, and they they decide what the world really needs is oh they need another translation. translation by by me. That's right. I mean, no, not. Okay. It's not. Stay away from it. Anyway, <laughs> just my personal prejudice there. Let's look at submission number five. Oh, last one of the day. Last one of the month. It's called Places Reversed. It's from Hands, Hands Low. It's a horse racing thriller. Oh, yes, Dick Francis, please. Lots of money there. Yeah. And this is. This is Hans's blurb. Places Reversed is a literary, intelligent and sophisticated story designed to appeal to a wide readership. Unusually for the genre, it has a plausible plot and characters who will ring true as racing people. The large cast possessing an emotional depth seldom seen in similar commercial novels. That's quite a mouthful. Not sure I completely understood it. And as much as it is a thriller full of clues and misdirections leading to an extremely satisfying climax, we all like that. It's also a novel about people on the edge and those who put and keep them there. I'm not I'm not wild about your blurb, I have to be, be honest. Um, but let's find out about you. I read for the bar, uh, then I set up my own business. As soon as it was sold, I went to live in France where I indulged my love of bloodstock and where I began to write properly for the first time. I had many ideas at various stages of development, including two other works of literary fiction, one concerning a man haunted by 5am things. Hmm. The other a man uh, in work in poverty. A man in work in poverty. It's about 50% of the British nation, isn't it? Um, both are dark <laughs> and hopefully funny. <laughs> As with places reversed, I've worked on the form with my writing mentor to hone it into a product ready for submission. Perfect. Oven ready. Oh, I shouldn't say that. Um, should I find the right agent, I'll come with two or three projects at an advanced stage. Whatever else I achieve as a writer, I want to at least establish a regular output of commercial horse racing thrillers. Very good idea indeed. Let's give you a thoroughbred reading. Get it? From our very own uh, <laughs> thoroughbred, purebred, bloodstock. It's Lex. Places Reversed by Hans Loa. Read by the shadowy figure standing just over your shoulder. An almost unnoticed pulse of dopamine betrayed Freddy Leon's suppressed excitement as he entered the gates of Etablissement Elie de Brignac. He stopped at the first bench on the short avenue leading to the main courtyard to check his catalog and calculated that it would be about an hour before his first horse went through. As soon as he got to his feet again, his phone began to vibrate in his pocket. It was Edward Hamilton, his bloodstock agent. Immediately, his mood changed. Valuable as he was, he had this intellectual zeal about him, Edward, that could turn ordinary conversations into lectures and cross-examinations. Before saying hello, Freddy said, Edward, I'm heading to the sales ring cafe now. Give me ten minutes, then come over and find me. Then, looking up, changed it to, no, forget that. It's too busy already. Meet me at the English bar instead. Hold on a minute, said Edward. That's why I'm ringing. Something's come up. Can you do without me for half an hour? Is everything all right? Freddy asked. Yes, it's nothing. You remember me telling you about having to take the car to garage? I've got to pick it up this morning, apparently. I'll get to you before the filly goes through, said Edward. Okay, said Freddy. Text me on the way. He stopped again to take stock. It would push things a little closer together than he'd planned, but that was fine. He'd take advantage of the extra time to prepare better for the meeting and dismiss Edward all sooner for doing that. Then as soon as they were finished, he'd go and tackle Penny, calling Felix on the way over to see her to update him with any last-minute news. Penny's would be the most difficult conversation, but it needed to be got out of the way before the day started. Another liquidation day had finally arrived, and he wanted to be live to every twist and turn it was to take. He was about to exit the main courtyard when he noticed that he'd been spotted by Johnny. 
Johnny Antoine Muller, Jam of the Bloodstock Journals, his wife's new beau. Flabby, continental, slightly effete, with an air of sneering haughtiness about everything he did, and nothing whatsoever like Freddy. He watched him put up his hand to cut short a conversation with a client, then turn towards his office. It was tucked away in the quiet backwater at the far end of the semicircular building that housed the sales ring, next to the exit chute where the horses were let out once sold. Knowing that a confrontation was coming, Freddy decided on the spot that he might as well get it over with. He positioned himself in the no-man's land twenty yards from Johnny's office door, in a space where they might not be overheard. That was when Penny appeared. Five feet one inch, light to the point of being frail, she peered out from behind her coal blackened eyes with an expression set somewhere between inscrutable and furious. Instinctively, he reached out his hand to her, then stopped as he saw that it wasn't reciprocated. Johnny followed her at a short distance. Separated this last year, mainly because of the things that were about to happen today. They were now just a financial settlement away from being cut adrift from each other forever. He braced himself for the onslaught. So you're not dead then? I hoped you might be when I saw the house shut up, she said. Charming, he replied. I'm here and I'm still slim and beautiful. He couldn't stop himself taking a sideways glance at Johnny. Good. Well, I'll have my three million quid then, she stuck out her hand. He smiled at the simple juvenile gesture. I've told you, if the worst comes to the worst, you can have the house. But if you give me some space and get off my back, and let me get on with my business, there's a chance I'll be able to settle up with you in cash sometime soon. Please? Penny continued to stand squarely in front of him. You haven't got a clue, have you? All right, I'm just going to hit my vote button now. So that's gone in. And let's see what the genie I thought for the last mission of the show and indeed the month. Um, lots of comments on Lex's reading. Everyone, everyone loves your, your, your yeah. reading, Lex. Um, and you're apologizing for your French accent, which you absolutely don't need to do. Um, <laughs> so Stacy said, wow, well, Stacy said something that just completely resonated with me. Yeah, horse racing thriller. Why not start with a thrilling horse race? Why not? Yeah. Um, a lot of character names all hitting me at once as Adrian. I know. I felt that too. I felt I was, <laughs> I was almost expected to know more about horse racing than I do, actually. I felt slightly, you know, intimidated by that. Who are these people? Says Chantal. <laughs> That's my feeling, really. Uh, bingo, Stacey. Also, uh, says Matt, also repeating the word bloodstock many times does not does not mean that those of us who don't know it will understand it. Yes, straight back to school for me in that case. Uh, James says, start with an incident with the horse. People talking about picking up a car in the garage don't get it. And Pamela says, who I happen to know is big on horses, actually. Uh, this sounds like dialogue at the local cafe that you put on headphones to avoid. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> What did you think there, Will? Yeah, I agree. Um, I mean, it's about horse racing, so let's cut to the chase. You know, you know, we're on the turf. Let's get let's get the sound of the let's get the beat of the hooves, the the wind through and blah blah blah. You know, yeah. get something going here. Yeah, the winning post. Uh, there's money riding on it. Yeah. What's happening? You know, yeah. who are yeah who are these people? Somebody said, you know. Yeah, and, exactly. and, and going to the cafe, the garage, it feels like it's sort of wandering around, waiting to, waiting to start. Yeah, yeah. it does. Needs it a does, boot. Yeah. yeah, and Pam also says a lot of editorialising. Don't tell us haughty juvenile show. Don't tell us haughty ju haughty. What? I don't know what it means juvenile show us who you are. <laughs> who are you calling juvenile? Uh, <laughs> I don't know what he means. Uh, the room said it for me, says Lex. We're following a mundane conversation with some people we don't know yet. We need a hook. Yeah, I think we absolutely do. Let's just come straight back to Will. And let's get, get some numbers straight away from you, Will. Um, if I can get my spreadsheet up here. All right, so hit me with your title numbers, please. Two. Two. And for the blurb. The blurb is self is self basting and needs completely rewriting. Yes. One. Oh dear. Oh dear. Yes. Well, I mean, I can't disagree with you. Craft. Uh, Craft. <clears throat> yeah. Some signs of writing. I mean, get yeah. it sorted out. Three. Three. Okay. I saw those signs of writing, and I because yeah, I also marked low on others. I possibly was over generous, but there we go. I've done it now. And bang. Final. Uh, final uh, commercial potential from you. 
As it stands, I have no idea where this story is going, and yeah. any any agent or, or publisher would go one. Okay. No. One. Wow. Wow. Okay. Well, there we go. You're telling me it is. Uh, you don't have to apologise. That's it's it's the right thing to do. You're to right. be Straightforward. Thank you very much, Jeff. Go for it. Hello, Jeff. Hi there. Yeah, um, I think I could add to much more to that. Really, it's pedestrian. Yeah. It wouldn't get anywhere with too many characters. It just flat. Oh dear. Yes. Yeah. All right. Fair enough. All right. Lee said soon as mended. Will, uh, Kate says, Will, tough but fair. Are you a Yorkshireman, Will, by any chance? Yeah. And Andy <laughs> says, Wake up, Jeff. <laughs> What's going on there? What's going on? What's going on? <laughs> got for me. <laughs> you got a 43 so far, hands. In fact, that is that's the final vote because we're going to draw a line under it today. So that means, what does that mean? That means um, we have a show winner. But it also means we have a monthly winner. And our show winner, I'll show you now. Well done, Matt. I think you intrigued. Yes, you intrigued Will just enough. You just pushed him over that hump. You intrigued him. Grim. Still don't know what grim means. But it also means that we've got a monthly winner who is who's been dominating actually right since the beginning of the month. It often doesn't happen like that. Quite often, the last show of the month, it just everything is toppled. But in this case, you are absolutely triumphant. Well done, Ella. The reality counter. Congratulations. Fantastic well work. Very, very well done, actually. And uh, wonderful things we hope, fingers crossed, will be happening to that particular submission. I want to say thank you very much, Will. How was it for you, Will, today? More fun than I expected. Thank oh, you. Oh, good. Good. <laughs> I think that's a qualified uh, yes, isn't it? And thank you so much, Jeff. <laughs> and thank you so much, everybody else behind the scenes who strive to make the impossible happen every Sunday. If you enjoyed it today, why not be part of it? Same time next week. Good night, everyone. Hit it! All hanging out with suits and ties Just sitting in the crowd smoking big cigars I hope you're ready for what's coming now I'm the one, I'm the lady go and bring it down Big boys play.